so I just wanted to remind you guys that you have the foundation of all good qualities um, living in your emails, in your Lamrim prayers, but you also have a hard copy in teachings from Tibet um, that you received a few semesters ago, maybe two years ago. It has Amitabha on the cover and lots of teachings from various Lamas. In the very back is foundation of all good qualities, eight verses, an outline of the Lamrim. So anyway, remember that you have this book living in your life somewhere in a bookshelf. Okay, <laughs> teachings from Tibet. So we'll start by setting our motivation. The foundation of all good qualities is the kind and perfect pure guru. Correct devotion to them is the root of the path. By clearly seeing this and applying great effort, please bless me to rely upon them with great respect. Understanding that the precious freedom of this rebirth is found only once, is greatly meaningful and is difficult to find again. Please bless me to generate the mind that unceasingly, day and night, takes its essence. This life is as impermanent as a water bubble. Remember how quickly it decays and death comes. After death, just like a shadow follows the body, the results of black and white karma follow. Finding firm and definite conviction in this, please bless me always to be careful, to abandon even the slightest negativities and accomplish all virtuous deeds. Seeking samsaric pleasures is the door to all suffering. They are uncertain and cannot be relied upon. Recognizing these shortcomings, please bless me to generate the strong wish for the bliss of liberation. Led by this pure thought, mindfulness, alertness, and great caution arise. The root of the teachings is keeping the Pradamoksha vows. Please bless me to accomplish this essential practice. Just as I have fallen into the sea of samsara, so have all mother migratory beings. Please bless me to see this, train in supreme bodhicitta, and bear the responsibility of freeing migratory beings. Even if I develop only bodhicitta, but I don't practice the three types of morality, I will not achieve enlightenment. With my clear recognition of this, please bless me to practice the bodhisattva vows with great energy. Once I have pacified distractions to wrong objects and correctly analyze the meaning of reality, please bless me to generate quickly within my mind stream the unified path of calm abiding and special insight. Having become a pure vessel by training in the general path, please bless me to enter the holy gateway of the fortunate ones, the supreme Vajra vehicle. At that time, the basis of accomplishing the two attainments is keeping pure vows in Samaya. As I have become firmly convinced of this, please bless me to protect these vows and pledges like my life. Then, having realized the importance of the two stages, the essence of the Vajrayana, by practicing with great energy, never giving up the four sessions, please bless me to realize the teachings of the Holy Guru. Like that, may the gurus who show the noble path and the spiritual friends who practice it have long lives. Please bless me to pacify completely all outer and inner hindrances. In all my lives, never separated from perfect gurus, may I enjoy the magnificent Dharma. By completing the qualities of the stages and paths, may I quickly attain the state of Vajadhara. Sitting with that. Okay. So speaking of uh, qualified gurus, um, we're really lucky today that Yangzi Rinpoche has agreed to teach 
Um, I think that uh, it's particularly cool because he's the author of your main text, uh, Practicing the Path, he's the author. And um, the Dean of Matripa College is gonna join him, Namdrol Miranda Adams, and she was the editor of the book. So um, I think this is a really good connection for us to make because the people at Matripa College are doing very similar work to you guys. They're not training to be psychoanalysts, they're training to be you know, psychotherapists or chaplains or various things, but they're mostly secular. And when we talk about Dharma with them, we're talking pretty much from a secular perspective. So um, Young Zee Rinpoche really understands the world you guys are in, in terms of your professional life. He's gonna understand things in a different way than a lot of the other traditional teachers who have come through because he lives in a big city, he teaches secular people all the time and he's fluent in English. So um, he's a really cool guy. I hope that you guys like him. I like him, I think he's great. He's... So anyway, just uh, you know, prick up your ears and be like, ooh, qualified guru coming. Let's see if he's one of mine. <laughs> There's a um, children's book in English that's called, Are You My Mother? Where this little chick goes around asking different animals, are you my mother? I feel like this with the guru sometimes. Are you my guru? Mm, no, are you? <laughs> Maybe. So anyway, um, today we could do a summary of what we've done before, but I think that, I think you generally get the concepts. It's just about applying them. I, I'm guessing that if we go a little bit further and kind of finish the small scope, then it's nice and tidy. So this is my plan is to kind of like wrap up the small scope. But if there's parts that you wanted to return to, we can do those first. So is there anything from the preliminaries and the small scope so far that you just wanted to check in about? In the preliminaries, we had basically how to meditate, relying on a spiritual teacher and perfect human rebirth. That was all the preliminary stuff, right? And then in the small scope, so far, we were talking about impermanence and death, and Bardo and those things. Look, in terms of practice, in terms of integration, if you just were to alternate your understanding of perfect human rebirth to give you a boost and your understanding of death is coming to kind of get you off of your bum and to kind of shake off the cobwebs, shake off the dust. So if you kind of gave yourself good news and bad news alternating, that would be a good way to apply what you've already studied. You know, it doesn't have to be a whole meditation. It could just be first thing in the morning. I have a perfect human rebirth and it's temporary <laughs> and it's amazing. I'm going to use it. Or death is coming. What are my priorities? Let me engage with them. So if you just kind of alternated between those two as your motivations, I think it would be really useful because you want to get off your bum and not waste your life, right? You know, it's just about kind of getting yourself in the mood to do the highest things you want to do, right? There's a million things you want to do. There's a million things you could be distracted by, but there is also the heart of what you truly care about. There's, you know, developing deep love, deep acceptance, deep wisdom for yourself, for your family, for your coworkers, for your patients. And then there's all the millions of things that distract you from doing that in as powerful a way as you could. So what are thoughts to say to yourself to get into the highest? And this is really up to you, but picking one of those two topics might help. Okay, so we're just gonna do a little karma conversation. Um, you guys know some things about karma, so this should be pretty familiar. So karma is a topic emphasized in two main sections of the Lamrim. So it's emphasized in the small scope and it's emphasized in the medium scope, kind of from two different angles. So right now we are here at the small scope and here we're looking at karma to one, develop awareness of the disadvantages of living without ethics, yeah? The disadvantages to yourself, the disadvantages to others, 
the disadvantage to this life, the disadvantage to future lives. Yeah, so you're looking at karma to kind of get yourself ethical. You're also looking at it to, to develop the determination to live in such a way that leaves a positive legacy for the future of your mental continuum and the connections that you've already made. So even if you don't believe in future lives, you do believe that this life has an impact and a legacy in the relationships you leave behind. And so if you're remembering that your current habit patterns and your current actions of body, speech, and mind touch people, and that even if you died today, there would be a lasting impact of your life choices. What is the lasting impact of those life choices? You know, is it going to be positive? Is it going to be something that you're proud of and happy about? So then also, you're using awareness of karma to develop a connection with a valid spiritual refuge. So these are kind of the three main reasons we look at this topic from a small scope, initial scope perspective. Because in the small scope, the aim is what? The small scope, the goal is to develop another perfect human rebirth to continue the spiritual path, right? The preliminaries, the goal was to have a meaningful life. The small scope, to continue your practice in future lives. The middle scope, the goal is liberation, nirvana. The great scope, the goal is Buddhahood enlightenment, right? So here in the small scope, we really want to get ourselves thinking about the future while being very present. Yeah, that kind of dual focus that is very much present and trying to cultivate active non-harmfulness. And that's what we mean by ethics, right? Non-harmfulness. And non-harmfulness of body, of speech, and of mind. And that this leaves an impact how you describe that impact to yourself or how far the reaches is a personal thing, but looking at that is very vital at this stage. The other piece of that is to realize some support would be useful if you want to go further and deeper. And that's where we start to connect with the concept of refuge. So then later in the medium scope, we look at karma again, but you're looking at it for the reason to develop an increased ethical awareness and behavior. So you're amping it up and also to develop the determination to be free from samsara altogether. So you look at karma to kind of make yourself disgusted with the harm you create and the pain you give yourself and others so that you develop this determination to be free. And so here is where the four noble truths are discussed kind of in depth. Okay, so if we're thinking about just the small scope, kind of getting ourselves into a karmic conversation and that leading to spiritual refuge, that's an interesting place to explore from a secular perspective because from a Buddhist perspective, you're looking at karma and then going into looking at the lower realms. Yeah, you're looking at hungry ghosts, you're looking at animals, you're looking at hell realm beings either literally or metaphorically, right? And you're getting that kind of, if I don't get my mind under control, I will create a reality for myself that is worse than this. Because what I have right now is the legacy of my past. You know, it's all of the ancestral knowledge and wisdom passed down to me. It's all of the love and care of my family as I was growing up. And now I've inherited this body, this mind, this education. And that's not gonna just keep going in a positive direction without extra effort. You know, it's like we were launched, whether you were launched by your previous life's work or you were launched by all the care and love your family gave you, something helped you get started. Now the question is, what are you doing with it? And is what you're doing creating even more resources to continue the path? So you're really checking in with like the 10 non-virtues, right? You're looking at what is my killing behavior, <laughs> you know? 
What is my habit of killing? What is my past of killing? Are there ways I disrespect life and I don't treasure and value life? What's my relationship with that? And what is my relationship with the possessions of other people? How do I steal? You know, I might not be a bank robber, but I also may not return things that I've borrowed, or I may take advantage of people. I may not even worry about taking advantage of people if I call them what a friar, what do you guys say, a sucker, right? If you think someone is kind of too stupid to know better and you take advantage of them, it's like kind of their fault or something. Yeah, so we just wanna look at our taking what hasn't been freely offered in terms of possessions, objects, people's time, you know, all sorts of levels of this. And then sexual misconduct, you know, what's our misuse of sexual energy? What's our kind of deceptive betrayal behaviors? And none of this is from the framework of, if I do bad, I am bad. It's saying, if I do harm, I create a habit of harmfulness. I make it easier to keep doing it because it becomes second nature. You know, like the first time you do the wrong thing and you know that it's wrong, your heart cringes and you're like a little bit disappointed in yourself and you think, oh, I shouldn't do that. But if you kind of justify it and excuse it, that same thing becomes easier and easier and easier. And it becomes as if it's not even bad anymore. You've completely broken your association with that behavior and lack of ethics. You know, and there's so many things that we do that are like that. So whether you believe in your own future life or the future of humanity and a civilized society, a humane society, ethics become a really key conversation. You know, and then you look into speech, right? You look at lying, which is obvious, you know, intentionally being deceptive. But then you look at divisive speech, which is even more common. You might be telling the truth, right? You're telling the truth, but it's meant to separate. And then harshness, you know, kind of wanting to wound and idleness, just like nonsense to fill in the space. And so, you know, again, none of these things seem that bad in the moment. It's the habit that makes them more and more negative. You know, they strengthen in their negative impact the more you do them. So, and then of course, mind, everything is from the mind. So we just kind of check in with covetousness, ill will, wrong views, namely looking at our clinging and pulling energy and our pushing away aversion energy and our dissociated, confused, foggy energy and kind of ask ourselves, which is our default, which is the strongest habit and kind of start there. So when you look at the 10 non-virtues and the result of the 10 non-virtues, the hope is that it triggers refuge. Yeah, that's the hope in the small scope is that you look at the harm the 10 non-virtues do just in life in general, but also the future that they lead to, the harmful impact it leaves, the permission your behavior gives to others to do similar things, the way society crumbles when people don't hold ethics as the core or the foundation. And so refuge is built on a healthy fear. Refuge is built on the healthy fear of what your untamed mind will create. And then it's also built on a faith based in reason, logic, conviction, experience, that the tools that the Dharma offers help you prevent that harm to yourself and others. Yeah, so a valid refuge is simply an ethical system and an ethical person and an ethical community that is unbiased and has kind of valid methods to take you all the way to your fullest potential. So it doesn't have to be called Buddhism. You know, anything can be called Dharma if it's going in that direction. But, you know, the key feature is being unbiased or impartial, you know, not discriminating. And also its ability to take you to your mind's fullest potential, however you describe that to be. 
so the way in which karma is framed in the small scope, does that make sense? And then we'll go into details about karma, but like the reason for it in the small scope. Yeah, thumbs up, thumbs down. Thumbs up in the back, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, refuge is important. And I think Venerable Sangha Kadro will return to refuge. But the question is, what makes you protected from yourself in a way, or protected from your own worst impulses or most damaging behaviors? You know, how do you stop hurting yourself? It's through the tools that you've integrated. So, you know, again and again, we're saying, bless me this, bless me that. But you know, in Buddhism, bless means I want my mind to be open to transformation. I'm telling myself open. I'm not saying save me. Yeah. So bless means something very different in Buddhism. We know that, but we're remembering again and again that it's a cultivation of openness to the support that is already there. Whether it's just from the human community in your life or it's from something divine, in order to feel the love that is there, you have to be open. And this is very obvious to us because we know the other direction. We know how it is to love someone and them not to feel it. We know what it is to have compassion for someone and wisdom about their life and their choices and for them not to be receptive and not to hear it. You know, maybe it's your children, maybe it's your friends, but, you know, imagine the Buddha's in a similar way where they're just flooding us with love, compassion, understanding, acceptance. And we only occasionally feel the benefit due to our openness, not to the, due to their care. Yeah, it's our openness. So refuge creates openness to connecting with that. And if you don't like the idea of it personified or religious or anything like that, you're just saying, may I be open to compassion touching me? May I be open to giving it back? You know? So karma, okay. I have to remind you of this because still, even after all these years, Sometimes when you talk about karma, it sounds like these mistakes still. Okay. So I'm saying it again, even though you know better. Okay. Karma is not describing any of these concepts. It is not fate, destiny, predestination, or reward. Karma is not punishment, retribution, caste, or unchangeable. Karma is not a judge or a jury determining guilt or administering justice. Karma is not justice. Karma is not God or personified at all, though it is personal. Okay, so you've heard this, but hear it, okay? Really hear it. Karma is an extremely hidden phenomena, more hidden than emptiness. So extremely hidden as opposed to manifest, like the water in my glass that appears obvious to my eye primary consciousness observing it in front of me. It's extremely hidden as opposed to just hidden, yeah? A hidden phenomena is like emptiness of an inherently existent self, that appears to the mental consciousness of an Arya Bodhisattva in single pointed equipoise on emptiness. So that's hidden, but accessible through merit and repeated accurate reasoning and meditation. Yeah, that's accessible. Karma is not accessible in that way as quickly. It's gonna take a lot longer and a more powerful mind to be able to see the whole spectrum of causation. And this makes sense logically, because if you think karma means actions and their effects, how can you describe or name or list every single action and cause and condition and part 
of even the simplest thing, you know, like what, like a spoon, you know, could you ever describe every single part where every atom, every particle, every inventor, every nuance of just a spoon, let alone a person, you know, the list would be endless. So that is why it's considered extremely hidden. So then in order to believe in it or live by it or hold it as a working theory, we have to rely on our observations of the natural world. We see cause and effect play out in nature. We see that a seed of a specific type can only give rise to a plant of that same type. And we also, on our reliance on the Buddha as being a valid being, therefore his teachings on karma are non-deceptive. He's a valid being for many reasons, but one of them is that the teachings that are related to manifest phenomena and everyday life and immediate experience, you can test and prove to yourself experientially that they're true. And when you prove experientially to yourself, it develops confidence that the things that are harder to prove are probably the case. So how does this work for you? The idea that karma is an extremely hidden phenomena that you can't prove it experientially in this second, but you can still hold it as an assumption of probably true. Does that work for you? As a working theory? Or do you just not, yeah, you got a random thumbs up. Is that pure us? Yeah. <laughs> Look, you know, the thing is, is that you also ask yourself, if I live by this, what is the benefit? The benefit you can see, you live an ethical life, you don't hurt people, you don't hurt yourself, your mind is calmer, it's not full of so many distractions, justifications, excuses, push and pull. You know, if you live in accordance with the law of cause and effect, you relax into fundamental ethics. And that benefits you in this second, this day, this life, let alone future lives. So there's an immediate benefit in living by this, even if every single piece of it, we can't touch through experience immediately. Yeah, so that's why we hold it as a very good working theory. So we've got substantial causes, we've got karmic seeds, karma. This I think is review. Um, I've emailed you this slide. So if you wanna read it later, you can. I think just to remember that a powerful karma that's strong enough to give a whole rebirth and a whole rebirth of effects needs to have these three pieces, right? There needs to be the preparation, the action has to be done and completed. So the preparation involves our motivation, whether it's wholesome or unwholesome intention to do something. There is a certain thing or a person that is the object of our intention, and we identify that person or thing correctly. So you plan it, you're doing it on purpose, it's intentional. And then you either do the thing or you ask someone to do it on your behalf, and they do. Once the action is finished or completed, the fulfilling the aim that motivated it, we like rejoice or are satisfied that it's been finished. And when those three pieces are complete, you have a full karmic seed that's strong enough to project a whole rebirth and a whole set of experiences. So, you know, things that are done incidentally, accidentally, mindlessly still have an effect but not nearly as strong. So new karma is mainly created through the omnipresent mental factor of intention via the actions of our body, speech, and mind. The ripening of past karma is experienced mainly through the omnipresent mental factor of feeling via the experiences of pleasant, unpleasant, and neutrality as well as other effects such as behavioral patterns. 
So this is why the omnipresent mental factors in minds and mental factors were really important to understand because there's the creator and there's the experiencer and there is creation and experience at the same time. Yeah, you're making something new while experiencing something old. And so what you're experiencing is not about what's happening 100%. And this is the key thing that we want to hang on to. So logically, what makes karma heavy or light is pretty obvious. It's what we would assume from our knowledge of the law or common sense, um, the nature of the deed, the intention and the deed itself, the basis to whom it was done, the strength of the habit for that action, and whether a countermeasure has been applied. So basically, if we regretted it or not afterwards. And so then we'll, if we've created a karmic seed, then we have these results. So the ripening result or the projecting result, the body and mind we will take in a future life, the causally concordant result, experience. That is, we will experience a situation similar to the one our actions caused others to experience, good or bad, and behavioral. That is, we will tend to do that action again in the future. And then environmental, our experience of the environment and climate where we live, as well as the climate and environment where we live itself. So karma operates this way in that karma is definite, karma increases, karma is personal, and karma doesn't go to waste. And these are explicitly discussed in the Lam Rim channel. And these are things that are kind of, if you're gonna live by the law of karma cause and effect, you have to understand these specifics. Otherwise it's easy to get confused. So the first one is just that it is negative destructive actions that are the substantial cause of suffering, right? The main cause of suffering is negative destructive actions. There can be all sorts of conditions that water that seed, but it's the substantial cause we're talking about. Positive actions are the cause of happiness, positive, constructive, beneficial actions. An action is made in order to save somebody else. Like so I see somebody hurting somebody, like a child or a, a, someone who is uh, weak. Mm -hmm. Someone is bullying somebody. Yeah. And they uh, step in to, to protect. protect. Mm -hmm. And in this um, um, acting, I also hurt this other person. I hit him or I don't know, to stop him. What kind of action is this? What was your motivation? <laughs> to help. Right? So, so it's... It's less heavy. Feel, okay. Yeah, it's less heavy. You know, if we're honest with ourselves, there's usually a part that is also, I want to hurt them for hurting a vulnerable person. And that part is very negative. But the part that wants to protect is virtuous. So, you know, it's, it's an example of, say, for example, you know, there's someone beating up a child and you push them away, thinking only of the child. I want to protect the child. You push them. And in pushing them, they fall down, they hit their head on the concrete, and they die. You had no intention to kill. You probably didn't have even much of an intention to harm. Your main intention was to protect. So you had very light killing karma, probably very light also because you regret the fact that they died. You didn't regret that you protected the child, but you did regret that the perpetrator died. So it's a lighter killing karma, which will lead to maybe some sickness or slightly shortened life in the future. Unless you purify it completely, then finished. But you could do the same action and push someone and they fall down, hit their head and die, but you meant to hurt them. It's a heavier karma. If you meant to kill them, it's the heaviest karma. So, you know, don't get lost in the action. It's always about the intention is the main driver.
of how strong or light it's going to be. Thank you. So it's not that you push someone down and kill them. It's why and how. Yeah, you, you clarified it. Thank you. Good, good. Yeah, but it's an important point. And, um, you know, it's important who it was as well. You know, was it a stranger? Were you already in a strong relationship? Did you have a developmental disability? Did they have a developmental disability? Did you have a strong mental illness present at the time? Did they, all of these factors play into it. So it's not, um, it's not fundamentalist, right? It's not like this always means this without any context, right? There's always context. Yeah, any, any other questions before I, I keep going with that? You can, please, now's the time about the time of the writing of the karma. Yeah. Explain to yourself or, for example, to a patient that is suffering very much, the karma, you're not explaining it to him, but even if you want to think for yourself, that the karma might be from past life. And this life, there is uh, maybe some good virtue. So how do you... Um, is there any order in this balagan, the karma? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you know, there is in the, um, if you read the full text, you know, what dictates what ripens first. And, you know, it's usually the strongest things ripen first or the most habitual things ripen first. So, of course, you could have negative or positive projecting karma, but then a different kind of completing karma. You know, they give the example of, say, an animal. An animal is a negative karmic rebirth. It's a negative projecting karma, but you could have positive completing karma. So that would be like a house cat who is loved and taken care of and given lots of mantras and cuddles, negative projecting karma, positive completing karma. Then you could have an animal who is prey, who is hunted, who is always in fear, who is killed very scary. You know, that's negative projecting and negative completing. So the same is true of us, right? We're human beings, that's positive karma ripening. But there can be, you know, this other side where, you know, kind of the completing karma of it is not so good. So what you wanna ask yourself in the back of your mind with other people is, is what they're experiencing something they continue to create? Or is it something that is very obviously from a past life and they no longer do that habit? You know, so you could take, for example, why is it that some people who are very horribly abused go on to be abusers and some people who are horribly abused have nothing but compassion and loving kindness for victims and would never do the same thing? Right. So they both have the karma to experience horrible trauma, but one of them still has the habit to keep creating the cause. And one of them has finished that habit and isn't doing it anymore. So in the case of the person who isn't doing that behavior at all in this life, you know, it's an old karma. It could be from thousands of lifetimes ago, but they've obviously developed their mental habits to not do that now. So you don't worry about them as much because they're finished that karma, that particular one at least. Now the question is just helping them heal and process and integrate and all that good stuff that you know how to do. The one that we wanna pay kind of stronger karmic attention to is the one that still has the tendency. You know, so maybe they would never harm a child, but they would harm an adolescent or a young adult. Or maybe they wouldn't harm in this way, but there's still something in the spectrum of that vibe, you know, that they're still doing. And that's what you kind of want to find a way to skillfully help them see the fault of or the harm of. If that makes sense? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, that's, it's the classic question with karma. Why do bad things happen to good people? None of us were always good people. None of us were always bad people, you know, beginningless time. For a Buddhist, it's a more empowered stance because then you don't feel like things are random. You know, that bad things just happen to you out of nowhere, causelessly, is actually a scarier thought than, 
I created the cause for this at some point. Am I still creating new causes for more of the same? Or have I stopped that behavior and everything related to it? You know, and then it becomes your ethical project of, oh, I don't do this really extreme version, but I still do this small version. I got to cut that out because one, I hate that result. That suffering result is painful for me. Two, it harms other people and I need to develop compassion and empathy. You know? Your Dharma explanation helps a lot because if you think about it in a similar way to self psychology, the more the splits the mind had about victims and perpetrators and good and bad, the mind is less stable and calm. The exactly. It's less splitted, there is more calmness in this life. So, yeah, and you know, what does it do to you to identify as a victim or a survivor or identify as a perpetrator or a harmer? Those two identities are very problematic identities. It's so hard to kind of break free and kind of become flexible and spacious again. If you're just assuming we are all victims and survivors, we are all perpetrators and harmers, then you don't have that like defensiveness and that agitation and that identity of I am the one who was wronged or I am the one who does wrong but I have good reasons so I justify them you know Israel right <laughs> so you know just gently doing that personally as an individual that opens up spaciousness in families in cultures and countries to have that conversation as well but it's hard if you don't have this worldview but you can still do it just using history, right? You just have to know your history, <laughs> you know, and go as far back as humanly possible to see that everyone has been the bad guy and everybody has been the good guy, right? It's so obvious when you study history, it's just so problematic in your face in the moment, right? It becomes trickier. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to understand what what is the way of the meaning of emptiness, how you use emptiness in dealing with ethics and karma. While you're talking about karma, you're talking very much uh, conventional, you know, uh, mm -hmm. as if there is something that is inherent existing. My behavior, my ethics, etc., etc. So how can I insert the understanding of emptiness into this conversation about karma. Yeah, it's it's the subtlest issue that we have to resolve, right? How emptiness and cause emptiness goes together with cause and effect. It's the subtlest thing for our practice to reconcile. So in terms of experience, you say, I don't know, something basic like I feed my dog, that's good. You know, I feed my dog, that's a good karma. So that is true ethically, that is true karmically, but it's not true from its own side. It's still empty of inherent existence because it exists in a context. You can only do the good thing because the dog is there, because someone taught you what to feed them, because you have the money to buy the food, because you have the mental space to remember to, because, 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 which proves how it lacks self-existence. So if you go too far into nihilism or eternalism, you think nothing matters or anything can be anything and I can make good things bad and bad things good and I can distort ethics, you know, if you go too far that way. But if you go too far into karma, cause and effect ethics and you become fundamentalist about it, then you have another problem which is thinking that this behavior is good in every single context, come what may. Even if the dog is overeaten and fat and needs to change their diet, feeding them is always good every time. You know, you become too concrete, right? So emptiness and cause and effect work together perfectly, but experientially that's the, the hardest thing to achieve with understanding the middle way. So, you know, we have to just keep sitting with it. But um, my favorite verse from Lama Chupa, verse 108, 
says samsara and nirvana lack even an atom of true existence, while cause and effect and dependent arising are unfailing. We seek your blessings to discern the import of Nagarjuna's thought, which is these two are complementary and not contradictory. So we just, you know, you could meditate on that verse the rest of your life. But maybe is that clearer? Or food. Yeah, more food for thought. So, you know. There's no inherent good or bad. Good and bad intention. Yeah, exactly. That's the razor's edge, right? I mean, if you if you need to make it simple for yourself, just say contextually, <laughs> right? This is good contextually. This is bad contextually, right? How good or how bad is also contextual. Right? What is hard for someone is not hard for another. Some of you are too hot and sleepy. Some of you are warm and enjoying it. Some of you hadn't noticed until I brought your attention to it and now you're annoyed and remembering how hot it is. You know, like con context, right? I think uh, this um, aspect of intention connects with the, um, with the our uh, understanding of empathy in the sense that uh, we don't look on, on things on things from the outside on the level of the behavior but uh, on the on the meaning uh, from, from inside mm -hmm. then intention uh, come, comes to to play the, the, the big role the, 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 the learning gets the, the big the meaning of, of uh, of the context, the, the context related to to uh, motivation. And motivation yeah. is something that that uh, one can uh, wonder and and uh, uh, and contemplate endless, endlessly. Exactly. Exactly, and it's like without examining your motivation, without setting your intention. You still have a motivation, you still have an intention, even if you didn't decide on it, you know, in a kind of purposeful, articulated, verbal way, it's still there. But the question is, you know, you can do some examination and check why am I doing this, saying this, being this, and you will never get to the end of why. You'll get some good reasons, you'll get some good information, and that's important and worth doing. But for us, what we say is there's a million good and bad motivations for what I do. Let me consciously join with the highest, even if it's not authentically there yet, even if it's aspirational, even if I'm not there yet, let me pull my mind purposefully to the best reason for doing this thing that I do. Because by doing that, I change the habituation and the energy in my mind. So long as you don't do it in a false way that is, you know, lying to yourself, like I'm doing this out of bodhicitta when really you're just trying to pay the bills. You can both pay the bills and have bodhicitta. But if you're pretending that part of your motivation isn't paying the bills, you're lying to yourself, right? So, you know, you're pulling to the highest and then allowing all of the others to try and come closer to it. So it'll take a while for us to have, you know, kind of pure karma, but gradually, and intention is the biggest piece. So. Another thought I noticed maybe. Yeah. Plus, uh, mentioning that karma is coming from the past, changing the future. This is exactly the definition of transference. 
Well, it's coming from the past influencing the present, and then what you do influences the future. There's an intermediate step there, but yeah. It's the concept, the intermediate. The medium of these two, the past and the Yeah. Yeah, and I, I understand more what you guys mean when you say transference now, and I think similar. Yeah. I think the only time I have resistance when, when you guys talk about transference or projection is, is whenever there's a flavor of it being finite or definable. Like you could get to the end of the context that makes you have the transference or the projections that you do. When we would say beginningless time, extremely hidden phenomena, you'll never get to the bottom of it. You know, you can't just, you know, stop with your parents or stop with your ancestors. It goes so far back and is so interconnected, you'd never get to the end of it. So I don't think normally you guys go there, but occasionally people in the psychology field speak as if transference is something you could explain every detail of why someone does what they do and why they project what they project. And we would say some things. <laughs> And what you observe is still conditioned by your own powers of observation and your own transference. And it's all really just an educated guess, <laughs> right? Educated guess. And you're just trying to educate your guess better and better. No. This is no? Not, this is not the case. Because it's not your parents, it's your experiences. And if you're listening as a therapist, experience here and you're like a to know. And are you immersing yourself into something that passed through you, the experience, so you're running the experience near. So it's not the facts, it's not what happened. It's an experience that being changed by you immersing them into it. Yeah, it's just that there sometimes sounds like, like you feel like you know what's happening for them. And you're making a good guess that is probably true in many ways, but it's still a guess and it's still not the whole thing. And that's, that's what I'm trying to say. So whether it's the experience near or it's the ancestors or it's a million different things, we just want to get out of the trap of feeling like you've got it. This is why or how, you know, it's like, it's one thing. Anyway, you don't have to agree. Um, so then karma increases, <laughs> so the magnification of karma from one seed, many branches and fruit, both positive and negative actions equally have this. Karma is personal, not experiencing the effects of actions you did not do. You created the cause, then you're the experiencer of the result the legacy of inheritance from your mental continuum of lives. And karma doesn't go to waste. So the actions you have done do not perish unless they are exhausted or experienced or burnt by anger and wrong views, which renders impotent the positive karma or purified, which renders impotent the negative karma. And this is done through either the wisdom realizing emptiness or the four powers using maybe Vajrasattva practice or both in a perfect world. So these are the two things that we're trying to work on to minimize negative karma ripening as suffering, Vajrasattva and the wisdom realizing emptiness. And we're just kind of skipping through these because we don't have time, but you guys know about the causally concordant results and the environmental results. And then you shift into the medium scope reasons for looking at karma. So increasing ethical awareness and behavior, and then very strong renunciation, determination to be free from samsara altogether. So then you'll look at the Four Noble Truths and yes, you know, Sangha Kadra will come back to this probably, but you're basically just looking at the truth of suffering and thinking there is no difference between ourselves and others in that none of us wishes even the slightest of sufferings or is ever content with the happiness we have. 
realizing this, we seek your blessings that we may enhance the bliss and joy of others. And so those are the types of sufferings. And then the second noble truth, the origin. And we think, should even the environment and the beings therein be filled with the fruits of their karmic debts and unwished for sufferings pour down like rain, we seek your blessings to take these miserable conditions as a path by seeing them as causes to exhaust the results of our negative karma. And so you're just kind of looking at the first two noble truths and the way karma plays out. So you have suffering, which leads to disturbing emotions, creating karma, which ripen as suffering. So you can break the links by remembering the third and fourth noble truths. So you can break the link between suffering turning into a disturbing emotion by prevention. The prevention is the wisdom realizing emptiness or thought transformation. If you miss that window, disturbing emotions and karma are about to turn into suffering. You prevent that through purification. Again, either with the wisdom realizing emptiness or the four opponent powers. So that's the summary. And uh, you guys have that PowerPoint in your email if you wanna look at it again. And um, I'll see you a little bit later. So we'll dedicate. Janjo sem jorim poche, make panam ke gyochi, ke van yam pame pahi, gone gondu pawa show, toni dawarim poche, make panam ke gyochi, ke van yam pame pahi, gone gondu pawa show. May we realize bodhicitta, may we realize emptiness. Okay. Thanks everyone. And uh, if you're curious about our guest speaker, I put some information in your email. So have a look if you haven't already. See you in a bit.